Danny Flexen here for Seconds Out in Abu Dhabi once again with Eddie Hearn. Eddie, how are you doing? I'm fantastic, thank you. I mean, a, a great facility, great venue, great press conference. Like, it's just a great place. I mean, I'm sure you're enjoying yourself as well. The weather, the excitement going into Saturday, we're going to have a huge crowd and the start of something very special here. Are you starting to get concerned at all about the confidence level among the opponents or the, how, the non-house fighters? I think that, I mean, firstly, by the way, Cal Yafai is a very tough fight. Uh, Galau Yafai has a very tough fight. Obviously, Cameron McCaskill is a tremendous fight. Zelf is the underdog in the fight. Zerdo and Oscar De La Hoya seem unbelievably confident going into this fight as well. Jessica McCaskill, I mean, we represent both, but what a fight as well. Honestly, this card from top to bottom, just a tremendous card and a, a great main event. And, you know, Oscar spoke very well about the problems in boxing of getting these big fights together. And you know what? He's right as well. Like, it's not the fighters. And honestly, it's not always the promoters. It's sometimes people that are influencing the decisions of fighters. Could be managers, could be advisors, could be all these people who, you know, we understand the business. We know what it takes. But ultimately, in general, fighters want to fight. They want the big fights. They want the opportunities. And Saturday is kind of like a celebration of that. Not just the main event as well, but the whole card. Is that one of the reasons why you termed it a breath of fresh air, this show? Yeah, because, listen, it's been a tough couple of weeks for many reasons, across the Conor Ben stuff, you know, AJ Fury a few weeks before that, Spence against Crawford, Tank Garcia, not my business, but still, like, we love the sport, you love the sport, we want to see it flourish, and I think it has so much potential when it's done right. The problem is with boxing, it always kicks itself in the nuts, right, and has done historically. It's okay, like, we're just, we're on one of these at the moment, and Saturday you'll probably see an unbelievable fight, and we'll be, you know, and next week they might announce Tank against Ryan Garcia, and next thing, boxing's buzzing again, it's booming. But we mustn't let people lose heart with boxing, and not just fans, but broadcasters, and, you know, at the moment we're in a very blessed position where there's a lot of broadcasters investing heavily in the sport. We need, we need fights that rate, and therefore you need great fights, great moments. And it's on us to try and do it, but it's not always that easy. But hopefully Saturday is a card that boxing fans can watch and say, I love this sport. What are the usual crucial factors between whether a big fight comes together or falls by the wayside? Well, I think firstly, there's two things to, to overcome. Firstly, is the fighters wanting that specific fight and their immediate team, their trainer, right? The moment that the trainer and the fighter says, we want this fight, then it becomes on everybody else. Now, it's all very well wanting a fight, but what is your perception of the value in that fight? When you have a fighter that's closer to their promotional team, generally there's enough trust that the numbers are right and real. The problem with boxing at the moment is people popping up with numbers that aren't real. Sometimes they're delivered, sometimes they're not. But what that does, and we've been guilty of that when we came into the market with the zone, is inflate the market and actually pay fighters based on commercial value that doesn't exist. And good luck to them, by the way, because that happens in all businesses, right? But I'll give you an example. You know, if Terence Crawford is getting 10 million to fight David Avenesian on BLK Prime and it does, I don't know, 20,000 buys, 25,000 buys, the math shows you that someone hemorrhages double digit millions in that fight, right? But they don't mind because they're coming into the market, they've got investment and the fighters benefit. But the problem with that is, is the comparison between what they might make in a Spence fight. And I go back to, you know, I, I don't feel for Al Heyman, but I also understand Al Heyman knows the numbers, he knows the market, okay? If the fight was as big as some people think it is, the fight would get made because the money would be there. But when you budget a fight, like you would for Spence against Crawford, you have to give your honest opinion of what you're prepared to pay as a guarantee, and I understand apparently there was no guarantee for that fight, about where you, where, what your line is on the pay-per-view, right? And my line on that pay-per-view would be three to 400,000 buys. That's where I'd be putting my, my guarantee at. Someone's told these guys that it does a million, right? Now, if it does a million, then you don't need a guarantee. You know, and, and Fury Joshua is a good example. Neither fighter asked for a guarantee in that fight because we know it does 1.5, 2 million pay-per-view buys. We know it does the biggest gate in history. We, but the truth is about Spence Crawford, do you really know? No, because otherwise Al would say, there's a minimum guarantee for 800,000 buys. This does a million 1.2, no problem. Because if you said to me to put a guarantee in place for Fury against AJ at a million buys, of course. 
not a problem, you know, but that's the problem. We just don't know about Spence Crawford. Neither guy has done exceptional across pay-per-view, and if the fight was as big as some people thought it was, it would get made. But, again, then someone comes in and says, well, you know, I'll give you guaranteed money to fight David Evanesian. Of course, if you're Terence Crawford, why not? You can't lose that fight. So, but then you get a fight that people don't want to see. So, it's not always that simple. And unfortunately, Danny, there's no barriers to enter, entry in boxing. So a lot of the times you're negotiating with a manager or an advisor that simply doesn't know the numbers. You know, like oh, I, I think I think it's worth this. What, why? I'll show you a budget. Like, you know, and we can all work off. Open book is great if the fighter is a draw. Look at Anthony Joshua, great example. That model, Canelo Alvarez, you know, that model where you say you own everything is great, but if they don't draw, like Terence Crawford or, or Errol Spence, that model's actually a waste of time. And that's why Terence Crawford turns around and says, I don't want open book. I want a guarantee. Why do you want a guarantee? Because you're not sure about the numbers, you know? That's it in five minutes. Just generally, Crawford and Spence, obviously, they might draw in their hometowns in terms of a crowd, but why aren't they bigger TV or pay-per-view draws, in your view? In my opinion, neither guy has really been promoted or pushed in terms of profile. You know, PBC have a track record of not being a promotional company, right? That They're not a promotional company that push their fighters. They don't have a figurehead that goes out there with a big mouth like me or like Oscar, and just, you know, and pushes the fighters, pushes them on social, pushes them 24 hours a day. So I think Errol Spencer suffered in that respect, right? He came over, he beat Kell Brook. This is a guy that should be coming back and doing 400, 600, 800,000 buys. It's just never caught fire. Terence Crawford, even worse in that respect. You know, when he boxed Amir Khan, top rank lost millions of dollars in that fight because it did 100,000 or whatever it was. You know, he hasn't been able to push the pay-per-view numbers. I don't know why. You know, maybe he hasn't been promoted correctly or maybe he didn't want to do or push himself with top rank or, or himself. We know he's big in Omaha, but Omaha's not going to put dollar signs on gates. That's the problem. Now you mentioned Fury Joshua earlier. Unfortunately, we're not going to be seeing that this year. What sort of opponent will we li are we likely to see from Joshua when he makes his comeback? There's been talk of Dillian White rematch, potentially. A lot depends on when he fights. You know, obviously, we've made the decision to fight in 2023 does he fight in february does he fight in march does he fight in april does dillian white beat franklin does franklin beat dillian white i mean the, the winner of that fight is definitely an option otto wilding has been mentioned i think that's a good fight philip hergovich has been mentioned i think that's a good fight zile zhang's been mentioned you know he nearly beat philip hergovich i don't think it'll be him but you know i think the thing is with aj is he's not really interested in like a non-compelling fight because he's got to get himself up for it he's got to have that fear factor and by the way all fights are dangerous all fights so if you're going to go in against Philip Hergovich why not go in against Deontay Wilder or, or Dillian White they're all you know everybody can beat everybody on their night so there's been no decision but it'll be a good fight and, and the plan obviously AJ arrives in Abu Dhabi this week and we'll um, you know, be looking to sit down with him and, and, and uh, confirm the date. Although you all wouldn't be involved in the fight, do you expect to see Fury against Usyk? Assuming Fury beats Chisora early next year, do you think that will come together? Tyson Fury knows boxing. He knows how difficult that fight is. You know, you can talk about him being a middleweight. and like, He's avoided him a few times, basically. I think he'll fight him if the money's right, which it probably will be. And yeah, I, I, th I would expect to see that fight in spring next year. And who would you expect to come out on top as the undisputed champion? I've, I've backed against Tyson Fury so many times and he's proved me wrong. Um, I just feel like Usyk is so difficult to beat. I said, I said recently, I said, it wouldn't be a great fight and everyone starts jumping on me going, oh, you're a hater. Like, you understand what I mean by that? Don't like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a compelling fight. I would, you know, I think it would be fascinating, but I do think it, it, it's not a fight that's really going to catch fire. But both tremendous talents, both very awkward, both very skillful. I'd probably say Fury is the favourite in that fight because of his size. If he, can, if he can get the tactics right, but he'd have to make it the kind of fight that, as I said, wouldn't be that compelling but could be the fight to win him the fight. Which one is easier to negotiate with to make an AJ fight? Because obviously AJ's already fought Usyk twice. Presumably that would be a bit easier, but maybe not as big a selling fight. But then Fury, maybe not the easiest negotiator. Talking about AJ Fury. To, against Fury the winner. Yeah. Oh, against the winner of... Uh, against the winner of Fury. 
Yeah, I mean, look, it'll be the third fight between them. I mean, we've been getting closer, but we've still got some way to go to beat Usyk. But I don't rule out that third fight. But, you know, the fight that we want would be the Fury fight. And I, I still think that fight will happen. Even if Fury lost to Usyk, I think AJ Fury is a massive fight. So, we'll have to see. Brilliant. Eddie Hearn, really appreciate your time. Mate,